Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me, actually. Um, I've been a registered kinesiologist for about 25 years, so movement is my life. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the chronic fatty liver disease that we're facing and how exercise is such an important role to changing that disease. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is certainly a disease that is harmful, but it is also reversible. If we look at what kind of lifestyle modifications we can make um, to, to encourage a better lifestyle, and that goes with exercise and diet modifications. And liver is one of the only organs in the body that can regenerate. So if we are in an early stage like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it is a reversible process if we make some lifestyle changes. So the key is to improve our longevity. We want to live longer, longer, healthier lives with lots of quality of life. So lifestyle changes are really important factors for us to make these positive improvements in our life. So what does exercise do for us? So exercise as a strategy for fatty liver helps to burn the liver fat. It improves our insulin resistance. It decreases the circulating glucose in our blood. It also decreases the triglycerides in the blood. It improves our liver markers and increases our basal metabolic rate for calorie burning. This is a long list of benefits and such a valuable piece to changing the projection of the disease. So what is aerobic exercise? It doesn't have to be something very structured. Exercise itself is basically any rhythmic continuous activity that increases our heart rate and our breathing rate. And so we look at calculating our maximum heart rate, and there's an equation we use looking at 220 beats per minute minus your age. So that means that every year this number will change. And as we age, our maximum heart rate will change. It's actually going to start to decrease. So typically what we'll do is calculate someone's maximum heart rate by using this equation, 220 minus age. And we never work at that absolute maximum. With exercise, we work at lower values. So with aerobic exercise, we look at the type, intensity, frequency, and duration. But these are not currently standardized. And so what we do is have some recommendations of where we start. The American College of Sports Medicine and the World Health Organization, they recommend at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. And what moderate intensity, moderate intensity means is it's 50 to 70% of your maximum heart rate. So from that equation that we looked at 220 minus age, we take that absolute max and find 50 to 70% of that absolute max. In addition, we could use vigorous intensity. That's basically you doing an activity that's challenging you even more. And based on the recommendations by the WHO and ACSM, vigorous intensity is 70 to 85% of our maximum heart rate for at least 75 minutes a week. So we can look at weekly activity as an important role in changing this disease. And how do we determine whether we're in that moderate or vigorous intensity zone? It's easy for us to use a rating of perceived exertion scale and helps you self-assess how hard you feel you're working. So the self-reported scale that you see on the, on the slides is a one to 10 scale. And if you look at the color green and the color yellow, so green is, is a rating of four to six out of 10 of moderate activity, and that means we're breathing heavy, we can hold a short conversation, but you're still comfortable when you're exercising. So that's that 50 to 70% of our maximum heart rate. And that vigorous intensity zone, we're looking at a self rating of seven to eight out of 10. So it's getting a little bit more uncomfortable, I'm more short of breath, and I can only have really short, brief, one sentence conversations. So when you're exercising, it's important to kind of self-assess how hard you're working to determine if you're working at the right capacity to help with fatty liver. And in, in addition to that, if you're, if you're working at the right capacity for your fitness capabilities. So how do we get 150 minutes of exercise in our week? We don't always have to do structured exercise. 
we can actually, actually interject activity on a daily basis in many, many sessions throughout the day. So it's really an accumulation of short or long bouts of exercise. So we can start with as little as five to 10 minutes. And our goal over time is to increase our time, our frequency, and our intensity. And it all adds up. So by the end of the week, we're looking to accumulate that 150 minutes per week of physical activity. The key is to reduce our sedentary time. Sitting, as they say, is the new smoking. It's really bad for our health. We see that sitting for greater than three hours a day is associated with all-cause mortality. We need to stop sitting so much, right? We need to get moving. <laughs> So it's important for us to choose a very tolerable and enjoyable exercise. Things like brisk walking, jogging, running, cycling, swimming, dancing, tennis, pickleball, team sports, high intensity interval training. The frequency is typically recommended at three to five times per week. However, if you're doing these small increments of activity, we can spread that out over that seven day period and it can look like any a very different on every single day. So how do we get exercise into our day? How do we inject it into our sedentary lifestyles? So it's important that physical activity, it lo it's basically look at any type of activity. It could be leisure, it could be planned exercise, or even chores around the house, things like gardening or mowing the lawn. So it's important for us to understand that instead of driving, we can walk or cycle for transportation. We can park our car a little further away when we're shopping, so we walk a few blocks. We can get off the bus one stop earlier and walk the rest of the way. It's important to encourage family to take part in our physical activity for some motivation and some help to get out there. We could walk the dog or get a dog because that's gonna force you to get off the couch. Uh, and if you're still in the workforce, walking during lunch hour is a great way to sort of break the habit of sitting taking the stairs instead of the elevator, taking up a favorite activity from the past, things like tennis or badminton, selecting a dance to your favorite music at home or joining a dance class at home. But the key really is making lifestyle changes and filling your, your days with movement. So aerobic exercise, if we were to compare what moderate and vigorous looks like, uh, in the table that you guys can see. Moderate intensity examples are things like brisk walking, cycling, water aerobics, tennis, ballroom dancing, general gardening. And on the other side of the table is the vigorous intensity. So I might be walking briskly, but I'm walking uphill. It's a little bit more uh, intensity focused. And then cycling at a greater speed. Maybe I'm running or jogging instead of water aerobics. Maybe I'm playing tennis in a singles event versus a doubles event where the intensity of the activity is just a little greater, forcing that heart rate and that breathing rate to increase even more. So how do we get started, especially if we're sedentary and we're not used to moving our bodies or exercising? It's important that if you've never been active, to seek some medical help from your physicians. In addition to that, maybe an exercise professional like myself to help you get started, making sure that you're working within the right capacity of your current fitness levels and giving you some goals and, and sort of elements of motiva motivation to kind of help you stick to your routine. And it's important to say to start with small amounts and gradually work on increasing duration, frequency, and intensity over time. The goal is to be as physically active as your abilities allow. So how do we get motivated? And, and it's really hard sometimes because we're all sometimes really tired when you get home from work and you just don't feel like getting off the couch. But it's important to exercise sometimes with, a, with family or friends. They kind of like hold you accountable, setting an appointment with yourself, using a fitness tracker to log your steps or activity. Because I don't know if, if, you, if you all have a fitness tracker, but this thing will remind me daily if it's time to stand up or it's time to move. And sometimes having those small little nudges on our shoulder to kind of coach us out of the seat is a great sort of additive. Joining a community walk program increases your social aspect as well as getting your physical activity in. And choosing an exercise that you enjoy and that you stick to. Because at the end of the day, the best exercise is the one that gets done. It's not that structured exercise class if that's not what you're used to doing. So you're best to stick with something you enjoy.
And then at the end of the day, rewarding yourself for being consistent with exercise is always a good call. Who doesn't like to go shopping if they're excited that they achieve that weekly 150 minutes? So the goal here is move your body regularly. With exercise, a bonus of that is typically weight loss. And we've seen that with fatty liver, it's ideal to have the best benefits of weight loss, about 7 to 10% of your body weight. So it's important to get started on a routine and then be consistent with that routine so that over that one year period, you can gain that 7 to 10% change of body weight, which improves that current disease. So res resistance training is also recommended. And these um, resistance training improves factors that contribute to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So resistance training are things like weightlifting. You could use machines or dumbbells or kettlebells, uh, body weight exercises, things like squats, push-ups, or pull-ups, or even resistance band. And in the research, it shows that resistance training increases our insulin sensitivity, decreases the glucose floating in the blood, it decreases, decreases the glucose production in the liver, decreases our abdominal fat, and more muscle increases our calorie-burning calorie capacity. So at the end of the day, it really helps improve how we feel, but also how we look. Um, and in addition to that, resistance training is helpful with injury prevention. So typically with resistance training, we look at loads and numbers of reps, and it's dependent on your current fitness abilities, your age, and your goals. And typically what we'll see for muscle building, building lean body mass, we'll, we'll use 8 to 12 reps and 2 to 3 sets of each exercise that we do. And the ideal recommendation based on the World Health Organization is two times per week of resistance training. So the goal is to avoid a plateau, and what that means is that you don't want to do the same exercises every single time that you work out and not change things up because the body adapts and muscles want to be progressively overloaded to become stronger. So if you've never resistance trained before, I would suggest seeking some help from an exercise professional just to help you get started. With older adults, balance and falls prevention are really important aspects to consider. And a lot of times people will say, well, I have really bad balance, so I can't really um, do a lot of exercise. And sometimes using things like activator poles or Nordic walking poles. And I brought a pair, I brought a pair to show you today. Have you ever seen people walking around the neighborhood with these poles? Um, they're actually really great. They, they really um, help with the balance, the core, and help you kind of propel that walking pace even faster than you would without the poles. Other things that help with balance and falls are things like Tai Chi uh, and yoga, because they work on improving your flexibility, but also challenging you with your core and your strength and your balance in some of those held postures that you're doing. So I'm going to do a little demo uh, with the Nordic walking poles. So these are great tools if you want to sort of help somebody get more active in a very simple way. And walking is one of those things that we can all have access to. So the poles itself helps to improve our posture. It actually activates our core every time that we put the poles down when we walk um, and improves our core strength. It also reduces the, the stress to the joints. So if people have a bad back or bad hips or bad knees, it's an effective way of helping us sort of offload some of the stress to the joints. And it allows you to walk for just longer durations. So I brought these poles and I'll show you. So what I'm going to do is basically just show you, like, naturally when we walk, we sort of sort of sort of take a nice little stroll. But with the poles itself, you, uh, the person behind you holds the mic close to you, so we can hear his talk. Do you want to follow me as I walk? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to follow me while I walk. But so what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk across the room, and I'm going to step basically with a really purposeful gait. And I can push down against the ground with these poles. So I can feel my core engage every time that I place the poles down. right? And I can actually increase my walking pace just by doing that. And you've seen, um, I think, uh, Nordic walking poles. So these are activated poles. These are rehab poles because they have very flat bottoms. But Nordic walking poles usually have a little boot on the bottom. And they tend to be slanted, as you see in the photo here. 
and they kind of help, again, propel you forward. So there's a lot of walking groups out there, even with uh, the poles themselves, or but just walking um, in the neighborhood with these is, is pretty cool. So, so another thing you could do with the poles, if someone is definitely balance challenged, or has a hard time kind of moving around, the poles provide that stability. So I just sort of selected a few exercises that I wanted to demo today to kind of help get you out of your sedentary chairs. <laughs> so what you're gonna see here, so I've, I've selected a marching exercise. This one actually, you don't really require anything. If, if you were to do this on the spot, I could just stand here and march. And what you're going to notice if you stand in March is that my heart rate and my breathing rate are increasing. So I'm now working at that moderate, moderate, vigorous, moderate intensity exercise in, in, in just a few seconds, right? So the idea here is to sort of help us understand that any kind of movement we do throughout the day, we can inject these moderate or vigorous intensity moments. So with the poles, if I wanted to add a little bit more core into it, I could stand with my poles, I'm pushing down into the ground, and then I'm doing my marching exercise. If I have a mobility challenge, I can do this with my poles in a seated position. So for example, I'm sitting here and I'm doing a marching exercise from a seated position. Sorry. So from a seated position, I could do my marching exercise here. And as I push down with the poles, my core is engaged with every movement that I do. So the poles are typically about a hundred dollars. Oh, did this turn off? I think um, you can also find them cheaper if you look at like sort of mountain equipment co-op and look at some Nordic walking poles, but the rehab poles are generally about $100. So another great exercise that you can do, and you don't necessarily need a lot of um, equipment for it, is a sit-to-stand or a squat. So I will often encourage people to basically say, every time you go to the chair, just do it 10 times, right? If I'm going to sit here and get up and down 10 times, I'm going to increase my breathing rate and my heart rate, and there's my moderate intensity exercise, right? So throughout the day, we can actually improve our ability to increase that 150 minutes so that we can accumulate that fitness throughout the week. If we want to make it a little bit more challenging, we could add weight to it. So I could do maybe a goblet squat. And you can't really get the goblet squat wrong because if I hold load close to my body, the body understands that I can keep everything really close and do this very safely. So now I'm increasing the intensity of the exercise. And if I wanted to, I could increase a shoulder raise and go up and down. So imagine if you did this every hour, <laughs> 10 times, and you got out of your chair. Thanks. So yeah, perform 10 sit to stands every time you get up out of your chair tomorrow at work. And the last one I selected to demonstrate is the push-up. So this is like a core and a whole body exercise. This is something that we can easily do around the house. Uh, a couple progressions or regressions are standing at a counter or wall and doing push-ups. So if someone has like low fitness ability for you to do a push-up in the kitchen is fairly easily done. And then if you get, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard. <laughs> and so as you progress, we lower ourselves closer to the ground. So the progression is doing push-ups at a chair. So at home, I can do my push-ups from here, and it's a little bit harder than the standing variation. And then the regression, or the, the regression would be on your knees if that's something that your fitness ability um, would be better suited for. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>